Greetings. My name is Jonas Peters, and I'm the Bren Professor of Chemistry in the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at Caltech, and also the Director of the Resnick Sustainability Institute. Uh, it's on behalf of the Resnick Sustainability Institute, otherwise known as RSI, and also Caltech, that I'd like to welcome all of you to today's panel discussion entitled Pathways to Net Zero and Negative Carbon Emissions. It goes without saying that 2020 has been a year of extremes, high heat, massive forest fires, and repeated major storms that have blanked the country, and all of this against the backdrop of an unprecedented global pandemic. The heat, fires, and storms, and perhaps pandemics too, give us a glimpse of what the future holds if we cannot curb the emission of gases that contribute to global warming. These challenges highlight the continued importance of our mission at the RSI, where we pursue new science and technologies that could alter the trajectory of climate change and help to make the planet more sustainable. In particular, through our Sunlight to Everything initiative, we're targeting new approaches towards low or zero carbon fuels and materials that, contribute, that can contribute to the reduction of carbon emissions, as well as the net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. While the promise of research drives us, RSI is also thrilled to be able to bring content to you such as today's webinar. Our goal is to convey key challenges and opportunities in areas where research can have a dramatic impact and to do so in a manner that is accessible, we hope to all of you. So on to today's topic. To minimize warming and the effects that it will cause, the world needs to rapidly increase the deployment of renewable energy technologies. But beyond that, we need to have strategies to remove these greenhouse gas emissions from our harder to decarbonize sectors. For example, heavy duty ground transportation, air travel, shipping, industrial and agricultural emissions. These are areas where we don't as yet have a clear roadmap, but where emissions must be reduced, netted out by 2050 or even sooner to manage the worst effects that might be anticipated from global warming. To guide discussion here, we've assembled a terrific panel who will bring perspectives from industry, government, investment, and research. I know it, it's meaningful to each of them to be able to share their thoughts with all of us and nucleate such important discussions going forward. So with that, I'm happy to turn things over to tonight's moderator, my colleague and collaborator at Caltech, Harry Atwater, who is Professor of Applied Physics and Material Science. Uh, he's also principal investigator of the Liquid Sunlight Alliance, otherwise known as LISA, which is a DOE funded effort to achieve selective, efficient, and durable generation of liquid solar fuels. Here he's also the faculty lead of uh, one of RSI's initiatives, that's the Sunlight to Everything initiative. And so with that, Harry, please take it away. Thank you, Jonas, and uh, welcome everybody to tonight's panel on net zero and negative emissions. Uh, and uh, before we get into it, I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, we have a distinguished group here uh, spanning uh, a diverse uh, array of sectors that bear on these important questions. And our first panelist is uh, Andre Argenton, who's the Vice President of Core R&D at Dow Chemical Corporation. Uh, and uh, Andre oversees the research programs and research and innovation within Dow uh, and has, uh, deep experience in uh, polymers and uh, uh, plastic supply chains and infrastructure, uh, and previously served as global director of R&D for intermediates and infrastructure at Dow. So welcome, Andre. Thank you, Harry. Pleasure to be here. OK, great. And our next panelist is uh, Mary Nichols, who is chair of the California Air Resources Board. Welcome, Mary. Uh, Mary has uh, served on the California Air Resources Board uh, for uh, governors of California ever since I've been a teenager. So a fantastic <laughs> career. Uh, and uh, uh, it serves uh, today as the, through uh, Governor Jerry Brown in his first term, Governor Jerry Brown in his second term, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, uh, <clears throat> Governor uh, 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mary's also an environmental lawyer. Uh, and has uh, served as a staff attorney at the National Resources Defense Council and has been an uh, assistant administrator in the EPA under the Clinton administration. 
So a deep experience uh, and dare I say a rock star for all those who care about sustainability and environmental policy where California serves as a world leader. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. And our uh, third panelist uh, is Dave Danielson. Dave Danielson is a managing director at Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Uh, and Breakthrough Energy Ventures is a uh, climate and technology investment fund backed by Bill Gates, uh, which is really aimed at tonight's subject of decarbonization and negative emissions. So he's really uh, in the thick of things. Uh, Dave also uh, has previously served in government and served as Assistant Secretary of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy in the Department of Energy, uh, where he directed innovation strategy related to transportation, renewable power, uh, energy efficiency, and clean manufacturing. So welcome, Dave. Thanks, Harry. Great to be here. OK, great. Um, what I'd like to do now is to begin by sort of setting the scene. So this is my uh, favorite perspective on uh, the subject, where you can see uh, both that from the curvature of the Earth, the finite, uh, finite nature of the Earth. The Earth is vast, and the sun shines uh, down upon it. And that thin blue line uh, that stretches on the horizon is uh, all that separates us from the uh, coldness and the radiation of space. So it's a very valuable part of our, uh, our world, our atmosphere. Uh, and uh, uh, speaking of Bill Gates, uh, uh, Bill Gates uh, started a little software company in Seattle. And uh, uh, then uh, in um, 2015 was already beginning to think about the concepts that became great breakthrough energy ventures. And, as the world's leaders gathered for the COP21 climate treaty in Paris, uh, he was formulating a white paper entitled Energy Innovation, uh, Why We Need It and How to Get It. And basically what it does is it plots uh, the uh, carbon intensity, the grams per CO2 per, uh, per kilowatt hour of energy in the economy and its evolution since the 1990s through the uh, time of the uh, uh, COP21 treaty. And what uh, he did was to basically uh, design forecasts that suggested uh, what would be the trajectory that the carbon intensity of the economy would have to follow uh, under the two degree, four degree, and six degree scenarios. Uh, and you can see that the two degree is the one that the world's leaders agreed to and uh, signed up for in Paris. Uh, and that's the blue line. And the dotted blue line is, in fact, the carbon intensity of all the added energy generation sources that we would need to add in the energy economy uh, going forward uh, uh, in order to stay on track to a two degree warming scenario. And so what that basically you can see is that we would need to nearly completely decarbonize worldwide uh, uh, our economy uh, starting essentially next year. Uh, and uh, so that's something that uh, basically is, uh, is, is out of reach at the moment, but is obviously uh, the decarbonization trajectory is very much uh, a goal that we're interested in pursuing. So from that, basically what we can see is that the world has a carbon budget, uh, basically the amount of carbon that we can emit in order to stay on a trajectory to warming that stays to, uh, to two, two degrees uh, C rise above uh, 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 pre-industrial uh, times. Uh, and we're going to overshoot it. Uh, and in the context of this, as we talk about decarbonization today, it's unlikely that full decarbonization will be uh, possible, but we're going to go as deep as we can. Uh, and deep decarbonization is more realistic. It's going to be very difficult to decarbonize some sectors. Air transportation is, for, for example, one of them. We'll get into this in the panel today. Uh, and because of that, we're going to need, in addition to decarbonization, in order to uh, recover onto the two degree uh, uh, climate trajectory, we're going to need negative emissions. Uh, and negative emissions means basically technologies for capturing CO2 that's already been emitted in a dilute form and sequestering it again in some form uh, uh, where it's uh, not in our atmosphere or oceans. Uh, and just as an aside, I'll note that since it's uh, uh, fashionable to discuss nowadays, that geoengineering is a very interesting option for potentially uh, or very, very uh, uh, talked about and uh, some, somewhat controversial option uh, to, to uh, uh, try to uh, uh, experiment with the temperature of the planet, but it will not uh, restore the planet's ecology to pre-industrial uh, times because it won't deacidify the oceans or decarbonate, uh, decarbonize the atmosphere. Uh, and then finally, a last thing, uh, if we think about this, basically it implies a, 
a massive deployment of infrastructure that we don't now have. Uh, and in order to do that, basically, we have to tap innovation uh, to, to generate net zero and negative emissions. And that innovation has to be able to cross the valley of death to scalable scalability in large markets. And it's not yet clear exactly how we're going to pay for that. Uh, so that's going to be an important subject to consider. So one thing I'd note is that uh, although you know, we think of uh, uh, change as happening in linear terms, that's the way humans uh, tend to think of it, we have uh, plenty of examples that technology in technology change is exponential. We know that from Moore's law and computing, where we went through about seven orders of magnitude over uh, 40 years uh, in the uh, uh, cost per uh, 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 cost reduction and cost per uh, gigaflop of computing. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, technologies for energy like photovoltaics have undergone exponential change too. Not seven orders of magnitude, but more than two orders of magnitude in cost per watt. Um, and over the same time period of this uh, uh, plot uh, indicates that while there are fluctuations, the price of oil remained approximately the same. So as photovoltaics as an example, we see this exponential change from one megawatt uh, when I was a teenager uh, to uh, more than 400 gigawatts uh, about a year ago uh, with a 500 cost X cost reduction. So today photovoltaics uh, is a renewable energy uh, industry with greater than $100 billion a year with more than 400 gigawatts installed, 100 gigawatts a year manufacturing capacity, a real, a real industry. Uh, and the module cost per unit area is less than that of a window. And the price is continuing to decrease. So that's a real opportunity for solar and, for example, wind power as sources of very low cost electrons. With those electrons, we can look forward to uh, chemical and electrochemical transformations that allow us to take water and carbon dioxide and nitrogen, for example, and use electrochemical processes to create uh, chemicals, fuels, uh, and to mitigate uh, emissions. We can look forward to processes that might enable us to decarbonize uh, typically carbon intensive processes like making cement or steel. Uh, this is a process diagram that illustrates that solar heating plus green electricity can allow us to capture carbon in the form of condensed carbon and graphite rather than releasing it as CO2 in order to create the lime for limestone and cement. Uh, and another pathway that, uh, of course, uh, we, uh, is uh, very important to our agricultural economy and the world's uh, needs for food is fertilizers. And uh, we can look forward to uh, processes whereby uh, green energy creates uh, chemicals, hydrogen, or direct reduction of nitrogen uh, to make ammonia. And so these are uh, things that, for example, direct nitrogen that is very much in the early stage not at all scaled at all uh, at the moment. Uh, and then finally, I'll note uh, the, uh, 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 an effort that is uh, 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 significant effort at Caltech, which is uh, generation of solar fuel, so-called artificial photosynthesis, where sunlight is used in panel-like uh, modules to directly photoelectrochemically produce products like hydrogen, ethylene, ethanol, and eventually gasoline-like fuels. So that's sort of a uh, a trajectory uh, uh, to sort of set the stage. Uh, so I'll go ahead and unshare my screen and uh, start uh, with uh, hearing some remarks from, uh, from Mary Nichols first. Well, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, I should start off by saying that uh, I feel like I'm here more to learn than I am to impart because uh, I accepted the invitation with the enthusiasm that you might expect of somebody who spends most of their days listening to people debate about policy uh, for somebody, for an opportunity to actually listen to some new facts and maybe some new ideas. But uh, my job as a policymaker requires me to try to um, create the environment, the policy environment in which new technologies can flourish and to deal with some of the questions that always come up about why are you incentivizing this and not that, or why are you supporting this or not that, and to maybe help to set the stage for that discussion a little bit. So um, oftentimes in my life, I have found that people who know a lot about science and technology 
think that policy should just happen, that it should just be done. And of course it doesn't work that way. And when they find out how messy it really is, oftentimes they flee from it. And there's certainly nothing about the last few years that we've lived through that would make it seem more attractive to most people uh, to want to really wade into the thicket of trying to figure out um, how to go about actually bringing about the changes that we know need to happen. But I think it's important to recognize that actually there is a fundamental um, commitment, both legal and political, that does exist to this day uh, to try to avoid burning up humanity and destroying both human and uh, other kinds of life on the planet. And to do that, we set goals. We set legally enforceable goals, and then we try to target money and policy towards achieving those goals. So it is the policy of the state of California that we should um, get to a zero net uh, greenhouse gas emissions goal uh, by 2045. Well, that has been actually signed into executive order. And we also have legislation that says that we need to get to a minus uh, below 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. And these are very steep and ambitious goals, but they have real consequences associated with them, including the efforts of all kinds of uh, regulators and uh, other leaders to achieve those those kinds of goals. So what we need from the people who are on this panel with me and uh, many of you in this audience is um, the best suggestions and a vigorous debate about what the best way is to do that. The way we will approach this problem is through something called the scoping plan. We're hard at work at one that will come out in 2022 and which will describe how the state is actually going to reach those goals. It won't necessarily put all of the programs into effect or provide the money, but it will suggest how that should happen. And um, I could not agree more that as we understand it today, that is going to require some breakthroughs both in the way in which we uh, we generate electricity and particularly the way we uh, distribute it, the way we move ourselves and our goods around and um, the way that we um, deal with what's already out there in the in the atmosphere that already exceeds what are safe levels from the point of view of of uh, weather and sea level rise and uh, other nasty effects that we're already experiencing from uh, climate change that's embedded into the environment so what we do is try to look at sectors of the economy including the so-called hard to decarbonize sectors which we're going to talk about and try to figure out how you can um, slice away at the emissions, hopefully looking in a cross-cutting way as well as just sector by sector, and come up with what should be both a successful and a cost-effective or as cost-effective as possible uh, means of, of achieving those goals. And that is that is the uh, exercise that we are engaged in right now. And what we need is to learn as much as possible about what's possible uh, in what time frames, because we know we don't have very long to make choices, but we also know that we have to give ourselves multiple paths, if at all possible, because while we can set firm goals, uh, we know that not everything we invest in or, or decide we want to do is going to pan out. And so we have to remain flexible about, meal, about means uh, along the way. Uh, that's kind of the framework that we're operating okay. in. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to hearing next from uh, Dave uh, Danielson about his approach to how to do this. Well, thanks, Mary. Um, I'm coming at this from an innovation and commercialization lens. And um, the real intended outcome that I'm hoping for is that that will get multiple startups that are in industrial decarbonization will have their nexus point in, uh, in discussions that, that ensue from this dialogue we're having here. And uh, indeed, three years ago, I came to give a talk at, at Caltech the last time and spoke about the importance of uh, cement decarbonization and the opportunity. And, and now I know at least one uh, cement decarbonization startup 
out of Caltech called Brimstone Energy uh, was formed, was inspired by that. So uh, excited to, to hopefully have that happen out of this. Um, you know, in, industrial is definitely, a de the industrial sector is a very hard to decarbonize sector. Uh, and the three gorillas are steel, cement, and chemicals. And I'm gonna just briefly touch upon and frame steel and cement and Andre's gonna talk uh, about chemicals. Um, and so it's pretty impressive the level of emissions we're talking about with cement and steel. Uh, between them, we're talking about five to six gigatons per year of emissions, which is north of 10% of global emissions. Um, it's amazing also the scale that we're talking about, you know, and that these emissions are kind of invisible in our built environment. Um, the, there are about 4 billion tons of cement produced every year. And it's the, I guess, the second most used substance after water by mankind. Uh, and so we're talking about huge scale here. Um, and essentially cement is just a, a you know, synthetic rock, right? Think about it that way. Um, and so essentially what you're doing is you're taking limestone and you're, you're heating it up to make calcium oxide and CO2. You use that calcium oxide and blend it with uh, aluminum oxides and iron oxides and heat it at really high temperature, 1450 degrees Celsius for a good amount of time to make this binder um, that we use so universally. Um, and for each ton of that material, you have more, more than half a ton of emissions on average. Um, some interesting observations that I, is one, half the emissions come from that first step of the chemical conversion of limestone uh, into calcium oxide and, and CO2. And the other half just come from providing that heat to the process. And so you have to address both of those if you're thinking about emission. Uh, what I've come to learn is that cement is one of the hardest areas to decarbonize uh, for sure. It's a very low cost material, $50 per ton. Uh, so you don't have a lot of room to work with. Um, and it's also a very uh, rigid, stringent industry that is very difficult to change. And so from an engineering problem statement, the four parameters or constraints I'd like for innovators to think about is, first, you need to have a widely available and cheap feedstock that you're gonna use for any cement. Uh, it has to be at the same or similar cost, the production uh, as cement is produced today to be successful. It has to be compatible with the more than $1 trillion of infrastructure that's in place today. And it's got to be simple downstream. And so my view is that you probably have to make a material either very similar to the material today or one that you can blend in small quantities to, to get into the market. Those are called supplementary cementitious materials, which is something we'd love to talk about more. But there are a whole bunch of great ideas for decarbonization that include um, things like using non-carbonate rocks so you don't generate CO2 when you, when you heat them up to make calcium oxide. Electrification in, uh, in order to like electrochemical processes to avoid the heating that we're talking about and others. Uh, and then to briefly touch upon steel, um, you know, this is similar size, you know, it's about, but it's, it's a little bit more valuable, $300 a ton. About 70% of it is coming from blast furnaces powered by coal. And 30% of it is coming from electric arc furnaces, which are taking scrap steel and melting it and blending it with some other steel to make, um, to make steel. And that's about 30% of the market growing to 50% of the market in 2050. So that's a, a big trend going to electric arc furnace. And some of the big ideas people are pursuing is can we use hydrogen as a way to decarbonize? Uh, and I think what makes that exciting in my mind is that we have cheap natural gas and cheap renewables as potential feedstocks, feedstocks to make cheap hydrogen. And so I think that gets interesting. You can keep in your mind, you need about 50 kilograms of hydrogen to make one ton of steel. So you can think about, about, how, much, uh, about how much you can afford is about $1.50 to $1.50 or so per kilogram of hydrogen, which is a challenge. Direct electrochemical approaches are also uh, very promising. And you need about four megawatt hours per ton if you can commercialize those processes successfully. And so you do need to get down to about 20 cents, $20 per megawatt hour or so, which I think is where solar is and is going and wind. So I think there's some promise there. But uh, one big thing I want everyone to think about is the way you get those cheap, those cheap electrons is through intermittent processes. And so I actually think there's a new, whole new field of endeavor that we need to be pursuing, which is new processes that can deal with that kind of energy input. The last thing I'll, I'll close with is, I think we should be very optimistic about decarbonizing these sectors. Even if you talk about a significant carbon price applied to these sectors or solutions that represent a significant carbon price, let's say 50 to $100 per ton, for a house that would be, let's say a baseline of 500 
thousand dollars, which is not true in Pasadena or Menlo Park, but elsewhere, you'd only add about fifteen thousand dollars or three percent to the cost of that home, uh, because cement is and concrete is a low a, a low portion of the cost. And for a car, you would only add about one percent. And so the consumer's not going to feel a big hit here, but the industry is. And so through the right policies, I feel like we can probably solve these. Andre, pass it on to you. Thank okay, you, David. Great. Thank you, David. So um, this is just a unprecedented time in the chemical industry. There are concerns over plastics in the environment and, and CO2 emissions. And both of these concerns are, are challenging the products we make today. They challenge how these products are used, how these products are disposed, and, and especially they challenge the manufacturing process we use to, to make these products. But, but at the same time, it's a great time for all of us in this call because the only way through those challenges is, is in innovation. Now, now, the chemical industry, I, I need to say, makes modern life possible, right? There would just not be enough food in the planet if it was not for, for the chemical industry in partnership with others. We, we would still be transporting 200 grams of food in packages that weight more than that food in itself versus in flexible packages that weight a very tiny, small fraction of that. Think, think, think about, about that improvement. Uh, there would just not be enough clean water. We'll be consuming massive amount of energies to keep our warms, uh, our houses warm and, and safe and mad scene. So modern society just would not exist. Now, despite all those compelling value propositions, the challenges that we face are here, they are real, and the industry is being asked to do three things simultaneously. The first one is the industry needs to continue to grow and deliver those materials that make modern life possible. We need to do it while significantly reducing and eliminating CO2 emissions. And we need to remain profitable in the journey so that we can command the necessary investments in the industry for the next decades. And each one of those three points are challenging enough by themselves and addressing those simultaneously make just like incredibly harder. And I think that uh, those problems are harder fundamentally for two things. And, and as a chemist, I like to think about the competition between a thermodynamic product versus a kinetically driven product, right? And starting with the thermodynamic product and, and the challenges, if you look at the chemical industry on average, the industry pulls four atoms of carbon from the ground, converts three carbons into products, your clothes, your thermal insulation materials, your flexible packages. And we burn one of those carbons, right? If you look at, um, at the industry crackers as the crackers are the basis for all the feedstocks production, we today supply the energy to drive the reaction in those crackers by burning fossil fuels. And that will that is the, the key source of CO2 in, in that specific process. And historically, we have extracted massive efficiency gains by improving the separation strain and honestly, fundamentally through better heat integration in the systems. But that is not going to take us where we need to go. The new thermodynamic reality is that there are new paradigms and new process and new technologies will be required. They are required to take the emissions to zero. Efficiency and optimization only is not going to get there. Now, the second is the kinetic challenge. Let us just say that for one moment that we had the technology today, whatever the technology is today, that we could, um, um, uh, that we would give those four carbons and convert those into products for every carbons that we start with and zero carbons would go to CO2. We have the technology today. If we had to implement that technology today and replace the existing asset bases that exists in the industry, society would have to invest hundreds of billions of dollars to replace the installed asset that exists on the planet. And, and this would uh, uh, require deployment of cash never seen in this industry. I actually think never seen in any other industry. You have to replace an asset basis because the one thing about chemical plants is that they last long, long times, right? Decades. And, and so they exist here. So this is daunting, but I am still confident that these problems will be tackled. And my key point is that why I decouple those two things? My key point is that those problems cannot be decoupled by academia and by industry. 
the technical solutions that need to be developed need to consider the installed capacity. And this is going to drive academia and universities closer than they ever been before. The control volume, thinking as an engineer, needs to be put around the, 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 the practical constraints of the industry. The old way of doing discovery without constraints and waiting till someone adapts is not going to bring the solutions within the time that our planet asks for. Just to be a little bit provocative, publishing in scientific journals, while absolutely critical, is not the only figure of merit that is going to tackle the urgency of the problem. And for fairness and to be provocative to the industry, the level of partnership and collaboration needed is one that was never demonstrated before. Now, the very simple fact that we are here today debating is a very good sign in the right direction. Programs like JCAP and LISA, where there is a strong voice of industry to suggest through the advisory boards where the technology should go is a great sign of the, that we are in the right direction. So let me finalize by saying why despite the challenge, I'm excited. Um, times like this, like I mentioned earlier, is, are the best times to innovate, right? The status quo doesn't demand nor pushes innovation. Um, specifically talking about DAO, I think we continue to hire brilliant people from the top schools in, in, in the world every year. This year was an incredibly hard year for everyone. And yet we maintain our discipline to hire the best and the brightest we could in the industry. And these people are working on these problems today. They are working on, on these problems. We have reduced greenhouse emissions by 15% in the last few days, uh, uh, years. We continue to deliver on our goals to uh, um, obtain 750 megawatts of renewable power by 25. We are actually the number one purchaser of renewable power in the chemical industry. We are working on these programs today. Some of those are going to be improvements that are going to be implemented in the next few years. Others are going to be uh, massive changes and they are going to be implemented over the next decades. But our researchers are tackling those today. We believe that avoiding emissions is key in the long term. There's no solution without avoiding emissions, but capturing and conversion into meaningful products should be considered in the medium term. They are going to bring value uh, to all of us. Uh, just to finalize, we have an incredible partnership with the top universities in the country. I, I'm really proud about our partnership with professors and universities. And we have a very strong partnership with customers and players across the value chain because no one can solve this problem by, by in, in isolation. From our CEO, our commitment to, to carbon neutrality is public and the projects we are working on uh, are real. Um, just look forward for the discussion on the panel today. And since we have such a broad Caltech audience here among other schools, I invite all the brilliant students listening to engage and, and learn what we are doing. So with that, I will turn hey. back to Harry. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, I guess we can all agree a crisis like the one we're in right now is too good uh, to waste. So uh, let's not waste that. Uh, and I think we've also identified three sectors, steel, cement, uh, and chemicals, which are you know, uh, the, the, the gorillas in addition to fuels uh, that really define our, our carbon emitting world right now and, and uh, the challenges. So a question to the panelists, uh, <clears throat> as we go forward, we, we've talked about the need to do this and some of the technology routes that might be possible. Uh, so one of the questions is, it, in order to uh, drive this transformation and innovation where we uh, either do it within a uh, established uh, large uh, company like Dow or an innovative uh, uh, early stage company like the ones that uh, Dave is uh, stewarding, um, it, are we going to look for early markets and, and uh, sort of return in small volume markets to propel forward? Or are we going to also look for policy to help guide the way? Is there, is there a purely market-based approach forward? Is that the best path or do we, do we also depend on policy? And I'll certainly look to Mary's uh, input there as well. So uh, uh, let me start with Dave uh, and uh, we'll yeah. go around. You know, Harry, there was this thing called clean tech 1.0 venture capital that we all were involved in and have some bumps and bruises and scars as a result of um, where a lot of capital was deployed into innovation in this sector on startups, especially. And we didn't have a ton to show for it. We have some, 
uh, Tesla and and some other comp first solar other companies you know we have a little bit but we was largely a, a failure and so I think one thing to your point is we have to kind of learn from our mistakes and you know my my metaphor is that we have about we have a playbook that we're going to look back on in 2050 and say this is how we got it done uh, and half I think half the chapters we should get right learning from the past and the other half we probably have to go right together over the next few years um, but one of the you know one of the things you mentioned is super important I think a lesson learned that we must take to heart is that I think we with the especially with the small innovative companies we want to we want to have companies that have high value first market um, adoption right yeah. because you you got to get in the game when you when you when you're making your first widgets or plants they're they're you know you don't have economies of scale you don't have your you're not at your ultimate performance and so you need to find as a startup you need to find some niches and so i actually i think that's really important and and sometimes policies can provide those right so like you know pioneer procurement kind of policies uh, and then the long-term policy signals allow you to go do the bigger things and go after those bigger markets uh, a good example for us is we have a company called Boston Metal, which is electrifying and decarbonizing steel production. But they're starting with high value metals, uh, let's say, you know, metals like vanadium and niobium, and then going okay. to steel in the long run. So those companies will survive and have a chance of growing. That's okay. just one example. So, so, uh, uh, so going after uh, the process and then uh, uh, as an as a innovation channel and then uh, uh, switching uh, to a, a to the scalable, uh, lower cost materials like steel afterwards. Uh, so, so Mary, uh, maybe I can weigh in with you and ask, uh, you know, what's your perspective on this? Are there, is there, a, in addition to a technology push, is there a policy pull that can, uh, can pull us in the right direction? I think there has to be a, a pull as well, because um, without it, you don't mm -hmm. get the, um, ability to even try out some of these ideas uh, in the real world. They, they uh, expire in the laboratory. I mean, I love the example of Tesla because Elon Musk is now, I guess, one of the richest people in the world as a result of this so-called, you know, not very important example. But the fact is that his success in demonstrating the viability of a, of a um, uh, electric uh, battery powered uh, passenger car that was also considered a very desirable uh, consumer object um, was enormously educational. Until that time, nobody believed that EVs would be anything other than souped up golf carts, which eventually you could force people to drive. And he just reversed the thinking on that, on that whole topic. Uh, and and a lot of other things have changed as a result of it, but he would not have been able to do what he did in terms of building the first Teslas unless the state of California had been willing to give him credits under our um, mandatory programs for dealing with vehicle emissions that he could then monetize basically at the expense of other car companies. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> that's a crude way of putting it, but that's in fact the way it worked. And yeah. I don't know the answer to the question of how you get the money to actually disseminate um, valuable innovative technologies without the ability to use tools like that. Okay, Mary, that's yeah. a great example. I love that. You know, because it, it's both, right? They went into a high-end niche product to begin with, you know, uh, and then, right. but they also needed the ZEV credit policies to have right. a, a runway. I think that's a great one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, continuing on with that, uh, Mary, uh, California is a trendsetter for the world, but California is not the world. So, uh, if we think about the lessons learned in California and we think about extending them across the United States and across the world, what are the lessons learned that are extensible uh, to the rest of the US and uh, maybe more globally? Well, I'm a, a big believer in competition as a way of getting things uh, to improve in general, that it's good for everybody. So being the only state that had a climate program uh, was you know a point of pride, and it was definitely helpful for attracting um, investment, especially in the beginning to California. But the great thing that's happening now is that other states, including Colorado, which have slightly different interests and approaches, are jumping in and developing their own climate programs. And it's a difference of degree 
in some respects, but there's also differences of kind in terms of how uh, business friendly or directly um, uh, beneficial or partnering with business uh, some states are comfortable with as opposed to others like California, which have a very heavy overlay of regulatory, uh, yeah. you know, it, and enforcement oriented uh, belief about how things can get done. And so I think uh, what we're what we're going to see is just that what is value about the Cal value about the California uh, example, in part, is the specific measures that we've undertaken, like the low carbon fuel standard, which I think was a brilliant policy innovation, which could be adopted in other places or more broadly. But it's also just the idea that um, a state can view climate action as being part of its economic strategy. And that's the thing that is really pleasing me the most in the early days of conversations coming from the Biden administration is that they seem to see uh, climate action as not just something that we must do, although it is, but also but something driving, that yeah. they can actually benefit our overall right. economy. And that's, so that's what we hope okay, to, great. Hope yeah. to show. <laughs> Harry, if you allow me to add one comment, yeah. while I am very, very far from being a policy expert, what I believe, and I've seen successful cases, when the policies are created leveraging from a dialogue of scientists, policymakers, and industries and society, then those are successful cases, right? When the policy exists to help bridge a gap between a product and, and an end result that is thermodynamically viable, but we need to bridge the kinetics challenge, then policy bring massive value to society, right? Yeah. At other times, policy, when policy doesn't include the dialogue between all those players, then um, the, the end result uh, is, is, is not as positive as when you have the right players involved. I think that's an important yeah. uh, element. So you want to send clear, consistent, and then achievable signals to the technology and innovation uh, world. Yeah. Okay. And scientifically grounded, right? Scientifically grounded, the most right. important thing. So, so Andre, continuing on, uh, you know, uh, We've talked about the chemical industry, uh, but you know, chemical and materials industries are very much intertwined with the energy industry, and they have both global supply chains. Mm -hmm. And as we think about uh, decarbonizing the chemical and plastics industry, and, and then of course there's a whole other issue about plastics up, uh, upcycling. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we uh, how do we uh, create uh, change globally? You know, if, if Dow uh, makes a, a change in its uh, uh, processes in Midland, Michigan or in Texas, how does that ripple across the world? It's, it's, it's a great question, Harry. And um, so first let us think about framework. There's a framework, fr framework out there that talks about the scope of emissions, right? Scopes one, two, and three. And, and I think that the discussion on, on CO2 emissions certainly are focusing on today on scopes one and two. And scope three, which is where some of the transportation costs and costs from the standpoint of energy costs and CO2 penalties, they largely in, in many cases reside on, on, on the downstream transportation. And if you isolate yourself and, and ignore those facts, Harry, you could end up with situations where if you put the control volume around your plant, you are making good to the planet. But if you put the control volume around the planet, the supply chain involved in those processes, um, you are actually doing more damage than good. And, and the lenses that need to be put into making decisions is one of a life cycle assessment of every yeah. new technology yeah. and product that you do. That, that, that is okay. the ultimate answer to your question, yes. Barry, is you cannot ignore the importance of a life cycle assessment. I, I am originally from Brazil and, and in Brazil, ethanol is huge and the ability of taking ethanol and making ethylene and from ethylene to polyethylene is, 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 is practice in the country. Okay. And, and so you think about it's a great, it, it's a, it's a great potential technology and can be practiced anywhere. But when you do the life cycle assessment in that case in Brazil of taking ethanol from where 
sugar cane grows in the country to where those manufacturing are, sites are somewhere in the south of Brazil, transport all the sugar cane or transporting all the ethanol, dehydrating, making ethanol, and then transporting it back to where consumers are. That's actually a, uh, um, the life cycle assessment of, of the process, depending on how you do, is actually worse than traditional routes from fossil fuel. Okay. So you can never, my answer to your question, Harry, is you can't decouple the transportation sector emissions from your life cycle assessment of whatever okay, new technology yeah, you're going to yeah. launch. If you All do right, it, right. you are, it's an illusion that you are making some good to society and to the world, to the world yeah. and to the planet. Yeah. Well, okay, great. You've already uh, begun to answer one of the audience questions, which was around the subject of life, life cycle assessment. And I guess uh, when we talk about things where we have big capital outlays and so forth, you really have to think about the amortization of the capital uh, uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, you know the fact that we can't uh, just immediately turn off uh, things where we already made a big capital investment. I think both you and Dave uh, made, made that point. Um, so I uh, wanted to, uh, uh, it's so I'll now turn a little bit to some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. Uh, and uh, so one of the questions that we're getting is, what are the limits of the electrification of transportation? We talked about Tesla. The question is, will air travel, rail travel, or shipping ever electrify? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, so I can guess I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say with air travel, when you want to travel to Asia or, the, uh, or, or to Europe, uh, uh, unless you plan on getting there <clears throat> in a uh, lighter than air aircraft, uh, uh, I'm going to say it's not going to be electric. It's probably going to involve fuel combustion. So that's why we're going to have to have green fuels. But let's take some other examples. What about heavy duty trucking or uh, uh, rail or, sh or shipping? Are there, are there green alternatives to fuel combustion uh, that we can we do? So, uh, I'll jump in, uh, okay. Harry, just share a few thoughts. We'd love to hear thoughts from the other panelists as well. Um, right, electrification isn't gonna work for long haul <laughs> uh, aviation for sure. Um, there are some uh, great entrepreneurs, you know, going after things like um, electrified aircraft that are powered by batteries for short haul. Short haul, um, yeah. And you know, thinking about completely new models where the utilization of local airports could dramatically improve and it, perhaps it could displace uh, some road travel and emissions. Um, we've seen some really interesting hydrogen powered aviation companies that it looks like they could, um, they can't do quite do long haul, uh, you know, like cross yeah. country, but they can do, uh, they could do, they have the, the entitlement to do, you know, uh, hundreds of kilometers, you know, like reasonably farther. Um, and, you know, and there could be a future where if you can get uh, hydrogen turbines, right, uh, that maybe uh, and, and innovations in storage, you could go further. Um, I think a, a very controversial area is long haul trucking. Yeah, I feel like you hear a lot of different opinions from a lot of people. There are people who are, are battery uh, optimists. You know, I think that there are limits there, of course. I mean, fast charging might be a, a, a real game changer there. Um, people are looking at hydrogen very seriously. Um, you know, one, one question I think about is, is, it seems like everyone in this hard to decarbonize sectors, they talk about they're going to use biomass. And I, uh, I think a really interesting question I've been trying to think about is what is going to be the holiest use of that limited amount of biomass that we're going to have? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it may very well be aviation fuels, but uh, I think that's an open question as well. Yeah, or chemicals right. as well. You, have a, you, you get into land use and resource use issues when you start talking about uh, uh, biomass or bioenergy, uh, ca carbon capture and sequestration and things like that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so another audience question is, uh, is it feasible for us to aim for direct air capture uh, or are we going to all, or in decarbonizing, are we going to be basically looking at multiple times through uh, CO2 emission, you know, coming from point sources and then finding ways to sequester that? So, uh, uh, any thoughts about whether dilute capture uh, from air or seawater is going to uh, enter into the picture? We just talked about biomass. That's, of course, one way to do direct air capture. Uh, but I think uh, the question might have been thinking about other routes as well, uh, technological routes. Well, so, so, Harry, my personal thought is, as the more diluted you are, the harder your problem gets. 
uh, from the energy penalty and that you are going to pay and that energy penalty <laughs> returns back CO2 to the environment, right? So I think that going into concentrated sources is, is, is the way to start. It's where the industry is likely trying to do. Yes, th there are efforts out there trying to capture from dilute. Um, it's, 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 it's an uphill battle to, to, to be yeah. fought. And, and so I think that um, you should, certainly shouldn't ignore those companies, uh, but looking at um, concentrated emissions is, is where you start. You, you want to, we are all looking, it's an energy play here, right? In the end of the day, it's all about the energy penalty that you pay for all these processes. And net net, if it's going to take you so much energy to, to concentrate or to capture or to produce the chemicals that are going to be used in sequestration of diluted sources, right? Then yeah. you, are, you are not making, again, on the LCA with the control volume around the planet, you are not doing any good to, to what your intent is. Okay. I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in, in concentrated sources. Yeah. It's an easier problem to tackle. Let's go. And it's hard enough already, right? So let's go there first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So go there first. Uh, I guess, though, to, yeah. to really do negative emissions, we're going to have to do dilute. Uh, so in some form. So Dave. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, it's really been interesting that direct air capture kind of went from being a pipe dream, you know, to more recently with the National Academy study that was very rigorous showing that maybe $100 per ton is is something that one could could dream about or envision and possible. And what's really interesting is we start to run something like um, a, uh, decarbonizing aviation. You know, if we a lot of the work we've done looking at bio biomass pathways, for example, um, it it would it would probably be cheaper if you can get direct air capture to that level to burn fossil fuel and do the direct air capture. Yeah, uh, there's a whole bunch of moral hazard in there, of course. Um, and I, I also think one thing that we need to pay attention to is that, that this would assume the subsurface sequestration. And I think that, uh, you know, I think there will be some geographies where it's going to be um, publicly acceptable. Uh, but I think there are going to be a lot where it won't work ge geologically yeah. and or from a public acceptance perspective. And so, you know, one game changer area that I'd love to see people work on is, is converting, you know, downhole conversion of, of a fluid to a solid, I think would do a lot to change um, to change that, yeah, as an example of a game changer that, uh, that an innovator could look at. So, so uh, could I just jump in with ahead, one Mary. thought that is related, but not exactly uh, to the, uh, on this point. And that is that I've noticed also looking at some of the questions that people are very interested in what can be done quickly. And uh, all of these things that we're talking about are, are on the horizon perhaps, but not exactly uh, off the shelf uh, technologies. And so I, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, as to this issue of both indirect emissions and what you can do fast, looking at the short lived climate pollutants is something that we have to factor into the equation here. And that means methane. And that methane, means yeah. dealing with the natural gas. It means dealing with biomass that's rotting in our fields and forests uh, every day. And that is something that we can deal with and find, um, I think, much more acceptable solutions for as well. Right. Yeah, the cycle time for methane, of course, being much uh, shorter than for carbon dioxide. So uh, if we want to get a, a big uh, sort of dose of uh, of uh, for forcing reduction, then uh, methane might be a, a target to go after first at lower volume. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think sometimes you feel like you've seen we've we've already come up with all the ideas, but recently seeing a paper on uh, direct conversion of methane from air yeah. as a way to reduce that could be very interesting if you could do a cost effective. <laughs> right. Yeah. I love right. that new ideas are coming all the time. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, speaking of new ideas coming all the time. Uh, one of the things I want to uh, get your uh, perspectives on, uh, you know, Caltech's an educational institution, and uh, we're interested in the future. We're in the future business, uh, and really interested in the question uh, aimed at young people. Many young people out there uh, would like to uh, commit their careers and their, you know, their livelihoods to working on decarbonization and climate action. I get many uh, students who uh, uh, have. Uh, you know, big commitments in those areas and people uh, uh, who are not Caltech students, of course, as well. Uh, and the question is, uh, for each of you, what are the fields that they should be studying now, uh, both technical or non-technical, 
and what will their jobs look like five to 15 years from now uh, as, as this world of decarbonization and uh, negative emissions uh, uh, gets into full swing. So let me start with, uh, with Andre since uh, Dow hires a lot of people. <laughs> it's a topic I'm passionate. Um, thank you for the question, Harry. Um, well, first, the, the, here's the good thing, right? The, the solutions to this massive problem, they are not going to come from social media. Social media. They, they just won't, right? And they, they will come from, from physicists, from chemists, from material scientists, from, from, from engineers. The, the solution requires material and science to be done. So my advice number one is be the absolutely best scientist you can be because the fundamentals that you are going to go through under your undergrad and, if, or, and your, your, your PhD are going to be critical. Um, Eventually, you're going to end up in an industry and whatever that is, learn the economics of that field because each industry has its own dynamics and decoupling the financials and economics and how society rewards that industry is a critical element for whatever solution you bring. Um, the com I, I keep insisting on the life cycle assessment and the importance of it and the complexity of these LC GAs, Harry, is incredibly large. You will be working in, in, in this field. You'll be working with people. If you are a physicist, you'll be working with chemists, with mathematicians, with engineers. Probably because with economists, too, With right? economists, with yeah. people that understand social behavior, because th th that is the magnitude that, uh, of the problem, requires all, all those points. And so the best thing that I've seen in my career is when engineers and scientists, whatever the field are, are working together to solve a problem. I think there's going to be huge opportunity for really smart people working and understanding these LCAs and, and find solutions. Um, finally, just a final comment is, I mean, I, I, I don't need to say there's so much hype out there on AI, but at the same time, the truth is computing power is increasing massively. And I see the scientists today that join Dow or, or any other industry sector today that come with a strong expertise in computer scientists to, to make them better scientists or better engineers. I think that that will make a differentiation for those, um, for, for those um, uh, future professionals. Okay, so Mary, uh, maybe uh, uh, what are your thoughts about, what are your advice for, for students and young people and what will their jobs look like? Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, I have little wisdom to offer on this point because every day I find myself learning from students and interns and young people that we've hired about how we should be approaching some of the questions that we are tasked with dealing with. But it seems to me that uh, we know, certainly know that very few people go to spend their whole career in one place in one industry or one type of industry. We know that the model of, uh, of even excellent world leading companies in certain areas um, is questionable when it comes to the seemingly built in desire to keep doing whatever it is you're doing now uh, on into the future. So people will just, you know, will just work so hard to keep mining coal or drilling for oil or because that's what they do. And it's not that they're bad people, it's that that's their mindset of what their what their business is and shifting that to a different kind of business is very very difficult for the yeah. corporate leadership it's difficult for government leadership too because we react to those larger companies because they're the ones who make their voices heard in Sacramento and in Washington so it seems to me that uh, I guess if there's one piece of advice that I can think of it is just to think hard about sacrificing um, security for something more interesting and being willing to move quickly <laughs> from, from one place to another when opportunities arise. It's probably something okay. they already yeah. know. Yeah. But, Stay light on your feet. Uh, but I think yeah. you also answered the question too, because you mentioned that you hire people. So yes, uh, that's, we do. A, yes, that's we great. Do. So that's a, there's a, not everybody has to be an engineer uh, and uh, or not, it doesn't have to do engineering uh, can get into policy. So we Dave, your thoughts about the, uh, uh, for students as well. Yeah, I always think of that one as like, 
if I were a student, what would I do right now, <clears throat> right? Um, so one observation I've had in my career with the, were dozens of kind of innovation projects at RPE, DOE, uh, the private sector is that what all the success stories had in common is great people going after a big problem in white space. So I'd really encourage people to go after open areas where there's not a lot of action, especially thinking about mega trends that, that everyone doesn't agree on yet that you think are gonna play out and go, go to that white space where the, you think the puck's gonna go. Um, I think it, more and more it's gonna be important to connect to the problem and the problem solvers instead of just assuming you know the, the uh, contours of the problem. And so I think connecting to industry and connecting to the people who are actually you know, deploying solutions is really important. And then there's some specific fields I think are really uh, exciting. I think mining, metallurgy, ceramics are making a comeback after kind of it was all biotech and, and semiconductor and those kind of things. I think that's gonna, that's gonna be really important. There's a lot of white space there. I think the world's gonna become more chemical and electrochemical and less thermal. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And one thing I mentioned before, I'll say it again, is I think that no one is really, even from a disciplinary perspective, solving this problem of connecting super low cost renewable electricity, which we've never had one to two cent per kilowatt electricity right, available right. at scale in the history of mankind, yeah. but it's in this funky form factor and connecting that to decarbonization solutions. And yeah. I, I think the people that figure that out are gonna, are gonna be, uh, they're gonna change the world and they're gonna get really rich. Okay, good. Well, on that uh, note, uh, so I want to thank our panelists for a really lively discussion and a wonderful hour spent. Uh, and uh, also thank our audience for listening and uh, joining us here at Caltech for uh, a very uh, interesting journey on uh, net zero and, ne and negative emissions. So thanks thank all. You. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. A lot of fun. Thank you all.